Hello Spectrum Women, it is I, Becca Laurie Hector here, back for another installment of Asking Spectrum Women. Uh, welcome to September, you guys. Want to apologize, I'm a, a little late releasing this month's issue. Um, I am having some transitions in my own life, and um, I know you guys understand how when we go through transitions, as we're, we're kind of working through that stuff, that our schedule changes, our routine changes, and that sort of throws everything else off, and so um, I'm in that place. I'm in a place of transition, and so um, I had overloaded my plate last week trying to get through this transition, um, and quickly found out that, no, that's not a smart move. So still learning all these years later. Um, and so I delayed uh, recording Spectrum Women so I could just uh, gather myself a little bit. Um, and this is the best time for me to do it. So um, I will stop kicking the computer so that it stops shaking. Uh, and I will get started answering your questions. I'm so excited to be back. So I hope you guys are having a good fall. Fall is sort of a crazy time. I know some of you are going into spring if you're on the other side of the planet um, and that's always a yummy time to be going into things um, <clears throat> so I don't know that's kind of where I'm at and in life and and things like that and I'm I'm ready I guess to kind of hunker down for hoodie season here and, and that's I don't know my favorite time of year in fact we just got some snow here in Colorado um, and that was really weird because it was 90 degrees and then um, two days later it was frozen and snowing and then it's back in the 70s so weird uh, anyway, let's move on. I have good questions from you guys. Again, if I don't get to all of them um, this time around, I will keep it on the list and I get to it in October. Um, if you sent me a question a long time ago and for whatever reason I still don't get to it this month, please feel free to email me again and say, hey, did you lose my question? Or are you going to get to it? Or could you? Sometimes I do. Um, if the question is really specific, um, I'll answer via email because I don't know that the answer will make sense for everybody. Um, or if I just don't have time to get to it, but I feel like your question is time sensitive and I want to make sure that I get you an answer so fear not you will get an answer for me whether it is via asking spectrum women excuse me or it is via email from me so that's the scenario all right let's get to your questions here we go um, all righty <clears throat> My question is based around this scenario. I was given five diagnostic tests to do myself, and they all indicate that I am somewhere on the spectrum. However, is it possible that I have just convinced myself and my psychologist that I'm autistic by having done so much research on autistic traits and attributed this, now understanding, this new understanding of myself within an autism framework to the point that I have skewed my results? May I just, maybe I just wanted an explanation. Maybe I'm not autistic, but started to believe I was. Not saying I was dishonest, but I'm not sure I believe it because I had to answer the questions. So, really, really good question. Um, there is a lot of stuff in here that we need to talk about. Um, first of all, those diagnostic tests are built the way they are built. There is no right or wrong. There is no um, cheating on them. There is no way to, um, really no way to skew your results. There's just too many questions and too many um, varying ways that they ask the questions um, for us to really play around with them. The other thing is about those questionnaires, which I'm sure you noticed when you took them, is that there was really no way to study for it, right? There was no way to prepare for those questions. And there isn't, and that's for a reason, right? We're trying to glean as best we can. Um, ooh, terrible. Sorry, you guys, no fidgeting. Um, and just to kind of glean you know, where we're at, what our history is, and that kind of thing. So let's just make that part of it. So we need to first part address that part. Now, I will tell you that I had this exact, almost word for word, conversation with myself when I got diagnosed, when I took those tests. Also, I said they were the hardest tests I've ever taken, and that is true to this day partially for this reason that we're talking about, thinking that I had skewed my results and, and I had, um, I, that I wanted so much to have an answer to, to my issues that I um, found the autism and then I made everything fit it, right? And I had that same issue. Um, the thing is that when you have that initial response, so pe before you took um, any of those tests, there was something that you read or some reason, some something that pointed you in the direction in the first place. That moment of recognition in that first place, before you did any research, before you did anything else, that first, hmm, moment, um, 
that's the one you're looking at, right? That's the one that turned you on to even do all of this research. And the research probably just continued to confirm for you your experiences, right? And so what I want you to understand is that those tests are done the way they're done. And there's a reason that we don't do one test. And there's a reason that we try to ask, uh, have some testing done with other individuals, not just the, the one person, but someone who's known them for a long time for all of those same reasons, right? Um, and so, you know, the testing is the testing, right? It comes out the way it comes out. Your reason for seeking testing is the thing you need to concern yourself with, right? Not the testing itself. The reason that you first recognize autism and sought out a diagnosis in the first place is your true aha moment. It has nothing to do with the testing itself, right? The testing is just to validate or to formalize this already known information, right? Which you've already discussed with your psychologist and all of those same things right um, so the other thing that I'm hearing in there though and that's uh, concerns me more than the testing itself right is that you um, have have clearly suffered the same trauma that many of us who have lived without a diagnosis suffer from which is that we no longer trust ourselves right we cannot even trust ourselves to take a test and not do something wrong in taking that test, not manipulate that test in some way because people have told us we're dramatic and manipulative people, right? Um, and what we need to do is remove that language from our head, right? That's the language, that's the trouble piece. Um, that's from the years of trauma, that not trusting yourself to take the test honestly, right? Um, um, that's the result that we leave in. And that's really why a lot of us seek the formal diagnosis in the first place, because we don't trust our gut instinct anymore. We no longer trust ourselves. Um, and that is part of the journey of your diagnosis. It is part of the journey that you need to walk down to learn to articulate your needs, to under self, understand yourself through the framework of autism like you're doing, right? Um, that's all part of it. Um, and relearning to trust yourself is also part of it. Um, and so I hope that you can um, take the diagnosis for what it is. Know that all of us on the spectrum are different. None of us all check off all the boxes, right? Um, and that, you know, it's about a percentage, right? And that's what those tests are for. But tests aside, diagnosis aside, the whole reason for finding it is to um, improve the way that you are living your life, right? Whether by providing supports, providing clarity, um, providing you the right stuff to research, or giving you a way to process through your life and kind of alter it through this new framework so that uh, you can have a thriving life instead of a life that you're just surviving, right? Um, which is why I teach my course and something I think you could really benefit from, not that I want to be selling that right here in the middle of Asking Spectrum Women, but go check out my website. Um, email me again if my answer made sense to you. I'm moving along. Here we go. Um, all righty. <clears throat> All right, so this is a great question. This one, um, wow, touches me. <laughs> Sorry to make a funny voice, but I do tend to joke when I get really touched by something. Um, alleviates my tension, I guess. Um, our vet says that our cat is poorly with high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, and thyroid problems. I knuckled down and she, reluctant, and she reluctantly said that if the weight loss is in her kidneys, then she <clears throat> might have two months, and she may well have more. I appreciated her candid approach. How the hell do I cope? I'm scared. Any advice on how to cope? And I still feel bad about not crying or having any response to emotional response to my aunt dying two years ago, who I loved, but my cat's death have always been highly emotional. Okay, I love this question for a number of reasons, but let's start with this, right? First of all, autistics grieve differently. You know how we do everything differently? Well, we grieve differently too. It doesn't look like it looks for neurotypicals, which means it doesn't look like what we see on TV, which means we then internalize that ableism and we say to ourselves, I'm not grieving right, or I'm not grieving because it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. Well, lie. Grieving is an emotional thing. We can be a participant in the grieving and get through it more quickly, or we can just stand by and let the grieving occur and it, it usually sticks around in our lives in a negative way. So what I want to tell you is whether or not you're aware that you grieved for your aunt two years ago, you definitely did. Do you know why? Because you're still talking about it, which means that you haven't finished 
grieving because you probably haven't addressed it head on. You probably haven't said, um, you know, this is a way that I can um, share how much I loved this person with the world and put closure on this thing, right? So that's usually what our holdup is. The crying, not crying thing, meh, not really a good judge, right? I'm not really a crier. I also have um, issues in terms of interoception and understanding my emotions, which is called alexithymia. And with alexithymia, I never cry on time. Never. It never happens for me in the moment. It happens to me some other time. And that is the same with grieving. It's I've experienced it with my pets and I've experienced it with my mother. I will tell you the experience with my pets um, was is markedly different than the experience with my mother, obviously. Um, and um, with my pets, I definitely cried more. It's almost like when I, um, the, the losing of my mom and going through that grieving period was um, I had too many, too much adulting to do at the time that it was going on to properly grieve through it or grieve in the same visceral way that um, we grieve over our pets, I feel like. I didn't have that luxury because I was the only one left and I had to do all the busy stuff, right? I had to close up all the things and the papers and the legal stuff and all of that stuff. And I didn't, um, so I didn't really cry in that same way that you're talking about your aunt. I didn't cry. In fact, I've only recently, and it's five years later, started crying about certain things, which means I'm still grieving and I might be grieving about this particular loss for the rest of my life. I don't know, right? Um, and. I think when, when it comes to our pets, um, it's a different experience and, and there's a couple of reasons for it. First of all, the bond that we have with our pets, the bond that we share with animals is different than the bond that we share with humans. Why? Communication is different. We don't use words to really communicate with animals. We don't need to, right? There's a lot of unspoken stuff that happens in that bond and other ways that we um, share. So what happens for us is that as our pet is getting older, some of us may be in this position where we're needing to think about making that decision for this animal, or it may happen unexpectedly out of nowhere, right? But we ne we don't get to turn to our pets and say, I love you, I'm gonna miss you, you were important to me, I'm gonna be sad, this is gonna be happening to you, I'm sorry this is happening to you, I will do my best to keep you comfortable. We can't say any of those things to our pets, we can't tell them what's coming. We can't, we, we can't. There's the only way to do that is in the time that we've put in with them, right? In that moment, um, there's the only way that we can share with them is to physically share space with them. Um, and I think that is a really hard part of it, right? There's a lot of things that when we're dealing with human beings, we solve by using words and we can't do that with our pets. And so we have to grieve them in a way without words. We have to go through their illnesses and their death in a way without words, right? Um, in order to be a participant in it with them. And so that whole, that one place where we don't, you know, where we don't use words and where we actually feel like we need to is in there, right? There's a lot of things we wish we could kind of let the animal know in that time period. Um, and then it's really hard to sort of explain in words or in process grieving an animal, right? So like, it's almost more acceptable that we cry and grieve for our pets and it comes more easily to us because we don't have a societal way of doing that goodbye, right? There's some of us choose to bury our pets or have their ashes buried or we keep them or whatever. I have mine behind me right there. That's my very favorite is cat, right? And um, we can do all different kinds of things, but it's not like we invite the world to come to our cat's funeral, right? It's a very personal, um, almost isolating experience to grieve your pet, right? It's acceptable to be sad, but to, to have a funeral or to a memorial service or whatever it is, um, is not quite as accepted. So where do you put that, right? You don't have a, a proper place to put that unless you create one, right? And so some of us do urns, we do, you know, we bury it sometimes, we get tattoos, I've done that too, right? Um, and so what I suggest in terms of, for, first of all, in terms of just um, understanding that we grieve differently. And so to be kind to yourself about that, because our grieving is never going to look like what it looks like on TV. It's just, we different, we do it all different. 
Um, and then the next thing is that, of course, the death of a person and a death of an animal in our lives is different, right? Even though I loved my mom and I'm sure you loved your aunt and, and all of those things, oddly, we spend more time with our pets, right? We're with them all the time and they rely on us. And it, when they're gone, there's a hole. There's, there's suddenly things that we're not doing and there's an awareness of it that's different. So to remember that, that it's a different grieving process, right? And for some of us, um, the loss is so great um, for that, with that pet because that pet was a support for us in one way or another um, and for many of us. And so it's a really painful time. You need to allow yourself to grieve. You need to understand that you grieve differently and you need to find ways to walk through the grief in your own way. So in terms of preparing, um, you, you can't really be ready. You, you just can't. You can think about what it might look like. You can kind of do the scripting thing in your head and kind of try to imagine how it's going to go down. But how it actually goes down, you won't have control over when, when you have to make that decision or not. Um, and so the best thing is to do what I'm always telling you guys to do, which is to be in the now, right? And spend what time you do have with that pet, not worrying about when they're not here, but enjoying while they are here. So that, you know, and saying all the things through your behavior that you won't be able to say with the words at the end, right? And so um, that's how I look at it. That's just some of my advice because I've been through the pet loss and I've been through the human loss and I've been through the judgment of others, uh, including myself, about the way that I grieve. So that is my overall take on that. Okay? All right. Moving along. One last question for this month. And then I think before I lose my voice, I best say goodbye. Okay, there was one that I, okay, can't find the one that I'm thinking of, so I'll read this one, I guess. Okay, um, so this was a question that was posted somewhere um, on one of the times that I shared, and this is the question. So, I have recently described myself with reason, I think, uh, with good reason, as resourceful, but that is not, that is not to deny. Sometimes I do it the hard way, long way around, and reinventing the wheel. Does that make sense as neurodiverse? E.g., I live in my little caravan, and even during the first year, I repaired and maintained a small leak with sealant. Now, 14 years later, I have found another, and unfortunately, let it fester to the point where I suddenly thought I need to sell the van and get another, which would throw my budget. But eventually came to my senses, all on my own, that I did it before and can, and can perhaps do it again with some more tools. Thanks. So love this question so yes this makes sense as neurodiverse so for a couple of reasons um first of all there's some component of this that i feel like is the inertia that we're all kind of in at right and we can find ourselves at so as you said it's been 14 years since you've had to use this particular skill set and what happens to us is we get rusty when we don't have to pull out that skill set all the time um, suddenly it's scary because it's been a long time. So you might have heard me talk a lot about how we shouldn't let time pass, like when we're sitting here in COVID, to not get so comfortable at home all the time because if we don't do some going out, um, we are going to become overwhelmed by the anxiety of going out into the world again because it's been so long. Something that I struggled with was driving for years. I Driving gave me so much anxiety and I would put it aside and I would say, forget it, never mind. Other people can drive me. Then I'd work up the courage. I'd drive. I'd think, what was I worried about for all that time? And then I would feed right back into the anxiety and wait too long to drive again. So some of it is that. It's, it's that rusty skill set. Can I still do it? Do I remember how, right? Um, it's also our black and white thinking in there somewhere, right? We have the tendency to cat, uh, I always say this wrong catastrophize there you go we have a, a catastrophize our um situation so on first looking when something in, a, in an emergent situation like this happens right our brain goes is it good or bad right and that's all we have is good or bad we don't have both we don't have a none area we have none of that so we go is it good or bad? And a leak, bad. Do I know how to fix this? I used to. Oh my God, this is huge. What am I going to do now? What if I can't fix it? Now I'm going to need a new van. I can't get a new van because that's going to throw up my budget. Blah, 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 blah. And now I have your whole post, right? That's what we do. We catastrophize and then we, we build into the, our black and white thinking. 
um, there and we just kind of run with it. But as you saw, that was your immediate reaction, but not your only reaction. So after that immediate emotional response, you gave yourself some time and you processed through, you came to your senses, as you say, and said, wait, I've done this before. I can probably do it again with a little bit of effort, right? Um, and that's what we're looking for. It's that it's, we have a tendency to, um, when a crisis arrives, um, we, we have a moment of panic before we can pause and logic it out. So our emotional brain responds first, which is with, this is an emergency. Oh my God, this is a bad thing, blah, 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 blah. And it builds on itself. Um, and then we hope, excuse me, we hope that our logical brain kicks in and says, wait a second, right? Don't be so emotional about it. Hold on. We've done this before, blah, 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 blah. Right. And so it's our really, it's really common for us because what we see is that inability to emotionally regulate. That's a common area that we struggle with, with autism and neurodiversity is, is um, emotional regulation. And so of course our internal response is this really high emotional response. And what we need to do is give ourselves the time to come down from the high emotional response and let logic come in a little bit and, and soften the situation. So yes, I say that is a commonality with those of us on, with neurodiversity is here's why I just explained to you those, those reasons why um, it's something that we struggle with, something that I think is common to um, people with neurodiversities. And that is my answer to your question, which I hope that you found helpful. I see that I answered that one in enough time that I can sneak one more in. So let me sneak in one more question. And again, if I didn't get to yours today, please email me at info at beccalori.com and I will send you a written answer if I can, um, if you've been waiting a long time. So thank you. Oh, I'm so like fidgety today. It's so annoying. Um, all right. So that's one more. Let's see. Here we go. I am a 33 year old recently diagnosed spectrumite after a lifetime of medical mental health issues, most recently anorexia, which I am currently in hospital for. It had almost killed me, but it led to my diagnosis. I am struggling terribly with my sense of self, my identity. I would appreciate any advice you have to offer. Okay. Well, this is your moment, girl. That's what I have to say to you. Um, we all get to that diagnosis place in, in all kinds of different ways. For you and for me, it was a mental health issue that got me to my diagnosis. Some of us get there for other reasons, um, but most of us are struggling when we find our diagnosis. That is the truth. So um, as you can see, you are struggling and I want you to let you know that um, any of the eating disorders are really common for those of us on the spectrum. Not only are we particular about the food that we eat, and that can be um, very easily lend us to having an eat, eating disorders and not wanting to eat food at all. Um, and um, it just makes food complicated for us. It really does. And so I want you to understand that on top of that, you're of course a woman, which means you are even more susceptible to an eating disorder. So I want you to know that you can get better. I want you to know that we're all cheering you on. And I want you to know that the way to get better from all of these things is through your diagnosis. So I know that you are struggling right now with a sense of identity. I remember that first year. I talk about the first year symptoms all the time. This first year is going to be so important in terms of this identity seeking. Right now, you shouldn't have a sense of identity. You just got a piece of information that is life altering. And that piece of information will color all of your memories and it will color all of your future memories, right? because it is the lens through which you process the world. So welcome to your diagnosis. Understand that it is a doorway to getting better, a doorway to building a life that fits you, that works around the things that you're struggling with. Um, it will give you the names of the things you are struggling with, and you will be able to articulate your needs in a way that you've never been able to do before. That said, this first year is painful. The first thing I teach anybody that I work with is to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, unfortunately, change, growth, um, knowledge, all of that stuff comes with a lot of discomfort. Um, on the other side of discomfort, though, is a hell, of a, lot, a hell of a lot of comfort that you've never felt before. So it's worth the work. This first year, be kind to yourself. This first year, do all the research and reading that you can. This first year, get yourself into therapy of some kind. Some folks are more motivated by art and music therapy. Others like talk therapy, like I was a talk therapy person. Um, 
and work your way through it. Really spend, dedicate this next year to finding your identity, to solving that question, to, to um, finding the answers to who you are, right? Um, spend this next year seeking your authentic self. Um, I remember distinctly starting to hide my authentic self somewhere around eight. So that seems to be a common age. It must have something to do with human development. Um, so I say go back to before eight and try to remember who you were back then before your difference would have mattered out in the world, right? Um, and, and try to remember who you are then. Know that there will be periods of anger at the people who never helped you, of how did nobody know, of all the people that tried and messed up, right? And all the times you suffered from your mistakes because you didn't know any better. You will be angry and sad simultaneously. It will happen. There will be some negativity to get through, but I promise you there is positivity on the other side. There is growth on the other side. Um, but this year is gonna be like tumultuous it's gonna be like stormy weather all the time you're gonna be having ups and downs and you're gonna be researching and thinking you're onto something and then be wrong and have to go somewhere else or thinking that some kind of support is working for you and you're wrong what I can tell you is the way to get yourself through it is first to put you and your self-care as a priority for this year and to really take care of yourself first um, and then to look to your peers find your community um, find us you've already started to find us keep finding us hang out in our groups um, find your other spectrum women, find your other spectrumites. Um, we are a strong community and we have lived it already. So if you get stuck and have questions, we tend to have an answer for you. We all have, regardless of how, of our age, when we grew up, where we grew up, we all have a lot of shared experiences. So um, we are a wealth of knowledge for each other. So make sure that you reach out for that. And on that note, I am going to say goodbye to you ladies and say very much I want you to enjoy the month of September or what's left of it. Um, please do something fun, create joy, share joy, um, do things for yourself, and remember to set your priorities, ladies. Um, with that, I am out of here. I will see you in October. If you have a question for October, feel free to comment your question wherever you're watching this video or email me directly at info at BeccaLaurie.com. Thanks guys. Have an amazing month. I'll see you next month. Bye.